Mark's gospel has now taken us across the sea and back again. And as Jesus and the disciples return to the shore, immediately we get a crowd pressing in. And one of the leaders of the synagogue shows up begging for his help. Without even a word, Jesus begins to follow him. Now, we've seen Jesus in action enough to know what's coming. He'll head right over there to Jairus' house and heal his little daughter. Success is to be expected here. So we follow Jesus and Jairus, and so does the crowd pressing in on him. The atmosphere must have been electric, and for some of us, maybe a bit claustrophobic. But then, then we get this narrative shift from Mark. We get an interruption in our straightforward journey to healing. Instead, we get this whole interlude about another woman and her health history. She has suffered a hemorrhage for 12 years. She has spent all of her money on physicians and cures, and nothing has worked. She's broke. She's sick. She's ritually impure. And she interrupts our journey to Jairus' daughter as she reaches out to Jesus in the hope for a cure. But it, Jesus, it turns out, has far more to offer her than merely a cure. To understand this, we have to understand disease in the ancient world. In our modern worldview, disease has typically been understood as a biological process. It's the malfunctioning of biological processes or of organs in the body. Symptoms develop that diminish our quality of life or even threaten our lives. And so what we seek is a cure. Restore the body to its proper function and bring an end to the symptoms. Stop the hemorrhage and the woman is cured of her disease. But in the ancient world, a world before germ theory, disease was multi-layered and affected not just the body and the mind, but also the social sphere of the person, and even the soul. So take this unnamed woman. We have a physical ailment, 12 years of a hemorrhage, already enough to complain about. But we can also see hints of a failing social network here. She's endured much under many physicians and spent all of her money on these efforts. What is her role in society now? Twelve years of debilitating illness, unable to work, nothing left to invest, and what about family? She doesn't even have a name in the story. No father here to ask Jesus for help on her behalf. No friends to carry her to him. All alone and anonymous. She must reach out to Jesus by herself. 
And then there is the issue of ritual impurity. Now, we should not make too big of a deal out of the idea of ritual impurity. In ancient Judaism, there were lots of things that would make you ritually impure, and there was no sort of moral judgment attached to it. Ritual impurity was not the same thing as sin. And in most cases, cleansing yourself when needed was not particularly difficult. It's all usually pretty mundane. But the reality is a disorder where you are continually bleeding would make you ritually impure for that entire time. And that means for this woman, 12 years of not being able to fully participate in the religious life of the community. So this woman reaches out to Jesus for a cure, for a cessation of her symptoms, ready to slip back out from the crowd and go about her life. But then she gets far more than she bargained for. Jesus knows what has happened and calls out for who has touched him. And in fear and trembling, she confesses the truth of what has happened to her. She confesses the truth of her loneliness, her isolation. She had hoped for a cure But her hopes were far too small. She enters the scene alone in secrecy, but now Jesus in front of all her neighbors with his words endows her with true healing. No longer just a woman, now she is claimed as a daughter. Now she belongs. Now she has a family, an identity in a communitarian culture. And that identity is as one whose faith has saved her. Go in peace, Jesus says in blessing, and be healed of your disease, be made whole. That is what interrupts our journey. A woman, a daughter of God, being restored to health in all of its dimensions, physical, social, and spiritual. But poor Jairus here, eager to get Jesus to his daughter, must instead watch and wait. And now before Jesus has even finished speaking, they come with news that it is too late. Perhaps because of Jesus' choice to linger here with this woman. Now... His daughter is gone. In the very moment one person has been given hope, another has just seen their hope dashed to pieces. One person has been claimed as a daughter, while another daughter has just been lost. Why trouble the teacher any further? they ask. But Jesus will not leave these dashed hopes and fears unchecked. 
Do not fear, he says in response. Only believe. And so with this promise of transforming fear into faith, we follow along to the story's conclusion. And we know how this will end. In the midst of the weeping and moaning, the laughing at Jesus, we already know what Jesus is capable of. And so it is fulfilled. He takes this little girl by the hand, 12 years old, and raises her up, restoring this daughter to her family. This is what Mark gives us in these two stories. A couple of glimpses at the promise that Jesus has made to us. A promise that in a world of disease and death, a world full of isolation and loneliness, in a world that tells some they are less than, in the midst of all of that, Jesus says, you do not have to be afraid, and you do not have to be alone. Like Jairus, and like the woman with a hemorrhage, reach out to Jesus, and that fear can be transformed into trust. That brokenness in you can be made whole. You can be not merely cured, but healed. Reach out to Him and be made well.